On this episode, I talk about negative reviews that are anonymous, the butt, and the climb. This is Gary Vay Nurchuk, and this is episode 79 of the Ask Gary V Show. Thanks for being on with me. Meerkat, what's up? Uh, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say, actually. <laughs> you know, I really just don't. Uh, I think we should just get into the show. I'm focused, I'm growing a beard. Uh, the je- oh, how do I have nothing to say? Darrell Revis has come home. Nothing is more exciting to not only get back one of the great Jet players of all time, while he still has some really solid years in him, but to take him from the dreaded, hated, awful, disgusting, worst ever New England Patriots has been just a tremendous, tremendous feeling, and I'm very happy about it. Darrell, welcome home. Teresa asks, what is your butt and how do you get off of it? What's the biggest butt you hear from others that's holding them back? So the amount of butts that I hear is actually stunningly overwhelming. Uh, you know, I, I pride myself in in not being a butt guy, uh, and so I think I think that uh, I think that the butts that I hear are all the time. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a chance. I grew up in a poor neighborhood. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't get the lucky break. People are loaded with butts. It's why the majority of people fit into the standard of one's life, right? Whatever those ambitions may be. I, I, I think that, for me, my butt is usually, but I love the process, I love the climb. When I don't achieve the maximum upside in my career, uh, it's gonna be predicated on the fact that I hedged about loving the process. And so within the context of finances, I didn't buy the Jets because, but, you know, is really, that whole thing is because, oh, I I, I liked the grind too much and that didn't allow me to scale and create the level of wealth I needed to be able to actually pull it off. That's my narrative. Um, And so that's my but. But I love the process. Uh, The amount of buts I hear though are just everything and and really, you know, what but is is it's an excuse. And um, now, look. Before I fit, finish with my rah-rah scenario, let's very much understand there's real stuff going on in the world. I mean, you may be born in a part of the world where there's you know, a dictator or communism or just a, nor- you know, do I think that it's as easy to be an, a female entrepreneur in the Middle East as it is to be in New York City? No, I do not. Do I think it's, you know, do I think that it's harder for somebody that's born in Mississippi, uh, 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 a non-white male in America, as it is for somebody that, that is born in LA, white male, to succeed? I do, but on the flip side, let me flip it, I think the hustle and the grind of coming from the grime has a big advantage. I see a ton of people, I, I think some, pe- some people think you're dead on impact because you're born a minority or, or, you know, or, or in a bad spot or to a drug infested home that you, uh, you're predisposed to losing. Ironically, in my weird twisted brain, in the game that I play, the hustle game, the, the, the real climb, like it, it's almost equally predicated on your spirit and your gusto as it is on your skill set. I think a lot of people that are born into Kush are in a setback situation because it's gonna come so easy. And uh, you know, so I just think it's how you optically look at the world. But I will tell you this, I hate excuses, man. I hate them with all my heart. I really take enormous pride and I mean it. I just had a, we had a hardcore, right guys, we had a hardcore meeting, I don't know if any of you were here, VaynerMedia meeting on Friday where I talked about stuff. and. And I'm always scared. I don't know if the, the team believed me when I said, hey, look, before I start, this is my fault. But I really mean it. I, I take pride in taking blame. It's crazy. You know, it's funny, this Jets Patriot thing. I see all these Pat fans making fun of me, right, yesterday. And I feel sad for them that they've won four Super Bowls. I like the climb and the grime and, and trying to win it. Right, and that's kind of how I think about buts and blames and excuses. I uh, I take pride and I like taking the blame in front of my whole company and saying this is my fault, um, even though I know there's so many other people that are at fault as well. I'll take that on me. And so uh, you know, buts are bad, 
Um, but they're not as obvious as I think some people may think. Robert asks, is there value in using social to engage with customers even if they're not in your market and will never buy from you? Robert, this is a great, 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 great question because writing the hashtag, I write a blog post about that thing, uh, you know, and all that stuff, but your question's the right question, which is what's the ROI of jumping in? So the Apple Watch comes out and everybody's talking about it. What's the ROI of, uh, you know, Twinkie, putting a Twinkie on their wrist and saying, yeah, this is our version of it, or, or riding a trend and putting out content of what everybody's talking about, whether it's that new technology, a new app, Meerkat, a, 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 a new celebrity, uh, you know, whatever it is, if they are not likely to buy from you. Look, I think, I think the value is very low, and I think that that may throw somebody for a loop, but the truth is the one upside is the home run, the anomaly, which is, you get somebody because they care about that trending topic and they amplify you, which then brings people awareness to your high-end shoe store or purses or your $50,000 pieces of art. So as people have become the infrastructure of media distribution, riding the conversation of what people care about with the hope that they create the retweet, the reblog, the share that then creates the amplification of awareness to somebody who was connected to them does have some Hail Mary, some rogue long tail upside. But speaking to and communicating with people who are not going to buy your product no matter what does not have enormous ROI. Never did in the old world, has a little bit more now because they have the opportunity to share it and become, bring awareness to people who may buy, but it is absolutely limited and it's a tactic that needs strong strategy around it. Brendan asks, I'm biking across Canada for Pencils of Promise and documenting my daily videos on YouTube. What other jabs could I use so that I'm not just right hooking for donations? Hey Brennan, uh, you know, as a proud board member of Pencils of Promise, I want to thank you personally for your adventures. Uh, you know, the jab content wise, obviously even this little question had a great content, beautiful views, India was really taken aback. Uh, and so, uh, let's just show India being taken aback. Wow. And so, that was amazing. Uh, and so, uh, and so, you know, <sighs> The, the jab that I'm looking for from you is you're in the mindset of, you know, you didn't take this biking adventure for kicks and giggles. Obviously the charity component is in you but it's not the only thing. People always do things that are selfish to them at some level. So you want to create video content and document it. Maybe you're a documentary thing. You know, you're using this great thing you're doing as a global jab to maybe bring you awareness to an opportunity in the future. I want you to take a step back because I think you're gonna do all the jabbing right, right? Put out good content on Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook and different native, you know, the book, Jab, 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 Right Hook, respect the platforms, put out good content. The one thing that I think is missing from a lot of people's repertoires when they're in this world is the listening, the bionic ears of what Twitter search is. If I were you, the other jab you can do at scale is to go into Twitter search and search people who are talking about Pencils of Promise and then jumping into their conversation. And not jumping in and saying, cool that you raised money, like, oh I raised $48 for Pencils of Promise in my school book fair, fourth grader tweets, right? Or the mom of the fourth grader. You don't jump in and say, cool, I'm doing this, watch this. That's too much of a right hook. You jab within the listening. Oh, I like that. You jab within the listening. And so what you do is you jump in there and say, that is phenomenal. And just by you interacting with that person, right, they're gonna maybe look at your profile and then they'll see your latest three or four tweets were around this content and now you've really double jabbed into the funnel of that donation, right? You jabbed within the listening, you jabbed with the content, that became the gateway to the donation or whatever you're trying to achieve the awareness. So a shitload more Twitter searching I think would be a tremendous opportunity. As a matter of fact, this is an enormous opportunity to do a humble brag. Um, uh, so D-Rock, you're gonna have to do some editing for this episode because I want you to really take over the screen and maybe use some music, maybe non-hip hop music. And so what you can do is take over the screen for 10 or 11 seconds because I want people to really, really absorb this very proud moment of mine which is some, some data has just come out of who has spoken in the social sphere to the most individual people and you can see I'm enormously proud papa of my execution of being number one. And Steve, I don't know if you saw, let's show Steve and his reaction to this. Not only was I number one, were double number two. I mean it was like, Indy, you saw the data, right? Like dismantled 
But I think, as a matter of fact, number two, three, and four combined probably get close to my number. I'm very proud of this and I think it speaks to the advice I'm giving you here. So it was fun to answer your question but it was maybe even more fun to humble brag that I'm number one in, uh, in actually talking to people and that's why there's ROI. Nicole asks, how do you deal with reviews that could impact your business? Nicole, this is a great question. One of the reasons I had always been a big push against guy, I don't know what that means, why I was a loud advocate in the other direction of things of Yelp and other things of that nature was they were anonymous reviews and I knew of PR agencies that were getting paid to leave negative reviews of their competitor stuff, which is why I was always a big fan of Facebook and Facebook Connect, real identity. There's two things to understand. One, I do think anonymous reviews and anonymous review sites are losing their equity. I do think that Steve uh, and, and India and all of you watching and everybody at Meerkat, what's up? Uh, you know, I love doing that. Um, take anonymous reviews with a grain of salt, right? Like that's changed. Like from 2004 compared to now, you just take them with a grain of salt because we've become cynical to knowing people do it on purpose. The big thing that I think you should do when somebody, you're right, we live in this crappy world where you guys are serving at a restaurant, I'm always using restaurants because they feel, or, or an airline. Airlines are doing things so right on a, like they are flying planes, machines in the air, on crossing the world like at scale, landing at the proper times, leaving at the proper times, keeping us safe, they've given us Wi-Fi in there, it's cozy. They're, these are big machines, they're like flying through the air and if it's like eight minute delay, you're like Psh! Fuck you, Delta. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy talk. Anyway, so you're right. You know, we don't get the credit for the good. We get dismantled for the bad, right? Like the athletes that are doing wrong things all over the place, all the ones that are doing charitable things and great things, nobody wants to cover that. It's just unfortunately the way it is. Now, oh, did, 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 uh, did uh, my boy Aton get a rare? Did he's making a comeback? That makes me happy. I can't wait to see what he did. Uh, make sure you email me that moment because I don't watch the show. Um, <laughs> I think that you should jump into any Yelp review or any Foursquare review or any review, any negative review that you have to jump in and answer every one of them immediately. Hey, salty pants 49, call me, here's the number, I'm super upset, I don't understand, I remember you, you know, don't fight it. You know, fighting it is feeding the wrong energy. Your business, this is their opinion, they could be wrong, but you need to at least have one more level of empathy and listening before you get into the, the fight of it. And so the way you can handle it is by jump it, monitoring it and jumping into all of them because the optics of you jumping in to the rest of the world is actually more powerful in the amplification of who and what your intent is and the depth of actually giving a crap about that one person really, really matters. Hey Gary, here's my question. When will social marketing spending be bigger than television commercials? Fred, great question. First of all, if you guys don't know who Fred Wilson is, then you know nothing about the startup VC community in New York or the world. One of the great VCs of all time, Fred. I don't like you for that. I like you because you're a Jets fan. We got Revis. Can you believe it? Um, so Fred, great question. I appreciate you asking it. Um, you know, my gut answer, and I'm gonna use social as current digital platforms. Let me explain why. My answer to that question is somewhere in the ballpark of 35, 20, 22 years. Long. And by then, I don't think we're gonna be calling them social networks. We're gonna evolve to whatever they are. But digital is eating up a lot of TV, but the web's been around for 20 years, the consumer web since 95 and banners and email and Google AdWords. They're still not making an enormous dent against television. Now we've got over the top. Um, I, I, my prediction's 22 years because all these things take longer. Um, I also think advertising in general is gonna change and the money's gonna go into content and it's all gonna be native and interwoven much more. Um, but, but you know, I'm not sure if I'm right about the year 20, 20, 22 years out. Uh, 2037, but what I will tell you is this, Fred, that the TV commercial industry is in the early stages of looking very similar to the late years of the newspaper advertising world. It was Craigslist that really was a very important kind of watershed moment 
to the death of newspaper advertising and I believe that it is Netflix um, that is the same to the TV commercial world because as everything starts going over the top and people don't want to consume commercials and really you could even say DVRs, right, TiVo uh, probably was the first precursor to it but we're well on our way. You know, question of the day, how many people in this room actually watch television commercials? And I don't mean this room, I mean the people that are watching. I mean Meerkat, give it to me right now. Everybody's watching when they want, how they want, outside of live TV shows, which are basically, you know, live result shows, you know, award shows, and sports. It, guys, without sports, the TV industry would be in such a different, different, different place. I asked my question today. Um, I really, uh, I enjoyed my mood here. It was a very kind of like interesting mood. It's an interesting mood, episode 79. Yep. 80 coming up. Tomorrow. Only 20 more shows before we hit 100. You keep asking questions, I will keep answering them.